Hey, welcome back to the Common Ground North Dakota podcast. I'm Heather. And I'm Jen. I've been a chef for 10 years. And I'm a registered dietitian. We've all heard the saying, farm to table. But what if the conversation was table to farm? Join Jen and I as we sit down with ag experts to dig in and find out more about North Dakota agriculture. Welcome back to Common Ground North Dakota. I'm Heather. I'm Jen. And we're back in studio today. I'm excited. I know, me too. Last session was fun. We We learned a lot about Common Ground. Yeah, and like what they do, how long they've been around. How to get involved. Yeah, and like what a fun way to incorporate agriculture into like volunteering. Yes. Or like how to get involved if you're interested. So so that was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, and today we're going to learn more about agriculture. Yes, we have an agronomist. Yes, yeah. Well, she wears a lot of hats, actually. I agree. I agree, and award-winning. An award-winning, yes. I'm excited to hear about this. Let's talk to her. Okay. (laughs) Well, welcome, Sarah. Good morning. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks for coming on. We're so excited to hear about your story, Sarah. Um, and I've even heard about you. My my husband is a agriculture systems management graduate from NDSU, and he's like, you know what? You should have you should have Sarah on. I'm like, okay, tell me more. So then I was reading about about you, and I just talked to him this morning. I'm like, hey, guess who's on our podcast today? It's Sarah, and he was excited. Oh, so you're you're famous in North Dakota. I feel like. What year did he graduate? Two thousand one. Okay. Yep. So he would have graduated a little bit before um, before I was done there or whatever. But um, but yeah, I was an extensive management person myself. So awesome. That's great. And you got your master's at NDSU as well, right? Yeah. So crazy story. I actually started at NDSU as a music education major. Oh. All wild and crazy things. Okay. Yep. And did all the music courses, sang in the concert choir. Um, if, quite honestly, if you're looking for a good music program, NDSU is fabulous for that, believe it or not. Okay. And, um, but, you know, I was spending all this time going home and working on the farm. And so I switched majors and went into egg systems management, um, ended up doing an internship, um, crop scouting, got a minor in plant sciences, um, worked out in the industry for a few years, working in the field and doing, doing a few things and decided I wanted to be a little bit more technical in nature. And so I went back to school and got a master's degree in in soil science. Soil science. Okay. So, so you're a consultant right now, Sarah, is that correct? Is that your role? I've done a number of different roles throughout my career. Um, and right now, um, I'm, I'm working for a company called GK technology. Um, it's a local company that hails out of Halstead, Minnesota. Um, and we are working in the precision agriculture arena. Um, so I actually process through agriculture data and, um, you know, help farmers understand where the variability is in their fields. And then I create prescriptions for their equipment. And so like I make variable rate for tons of variable rate, fertilizer prescriptions, seed prescriptions, um, in, anything that you can imagine that we can do from like a variable rate standpoint. I help them help farmers manage their drainage. Um, I make surface drainage maps and we do drain tile planning. So all of those kinds of things. But in my past, I've worked for um, different cooperative elevators as a retail agronomist where I would do crop scouting and actually sell, you know, seed fertilizer and pesticides and advise them on how to use use those things. Um, Okay. I, I worked for a couple of uh, larger corporations, um, both Monsanto, and I also worked for um, Corteva and the Pioneer Umbrella. Um, I I had the the opportunity. One of my favorite jobs that I think I ever did was being an independent crop consultant. That was one of the most special jobs that I ever had. Um, all I was was an information resource for the farmers. You go out to the fields, you scout the crop every week and um, advise the farmers on how to manage that crop, especially for their inputs, like seed, fertilizer, and chemicals. So I would tell them what to put in their sprayers, how to spray it, um, and and yeah, basically do all wow. of that. So I'm scouting like, you know, 20,000 acres a week there for a while and everything wow. like that. It was, 
it was a great experience. You get to know your farmers really, really well. And um, it's a very, it's a very special relationship to, to work with that farm. So, it almost yeah. seems like, you know, you were talking about prescriptions right. and you're talking like you're about doctor. like the wellness, <laughs> like of the, the land yes. and like you're, you're prescribing different mm-hmm. things. Yeah. It sounds like you're like a, a wellness coach for farmers so right, and their crops. The field's kind of like <laughs> your patient. You go to yeah. the fields and you check the soil to see what, Sarah? What? Yeah. What? So, um, so when you're when you're thinking about an agronomist and what they're doing, it really depends on the type of the t- what's going on during that that part part of the year. But I think you both nailed it on the head. Um, so um, in the fall, they're like, "What's coming up here now? Um, we're harvesting the crop. So as soon as we get done harvesting the crop, we'll go out and soil sample. So okay. literally." The- Ores of soil, mm-hmm. and we've got this all figured out. You know, zero to six, six to twenty-four inches. We send those cores in, get them analyzed for how you know organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, any anything you can imagine that we can analyze that soil for. We're going to do that because when I get that information back, then it helps me figure out what do we actually need to apply in that field next year. Farmers okay. don't just want to apply fertilizers and pesticides with no rhyme or reason right it comes for money right we lived here and we want to make sure we're taking care of the land mm-hmm. and so um these are ways out that, that we do that and then during the growing season like right now also there's crops that are not ready to be harvested so we're watching them constantly for bugs and um and diseases there's tons of bugs this year all over the place so agronomists are out there busy counting um for example soybean aphids that's one uh, that i always work with that doesn't sound good no it the little green yeah. things they're green yep. right yeah they are you totally <laughs> nailed it you can count 258 bits per plant on 80 percent of the field with Ooh. increasing numbers oh no Ooh, that but sounds can, terrible but you can get those off with a certain chemical yeah and okay. sarah yep. when you're you're analyzing the soil and you come up with like, okay, it's lacking in this. Does it depend on what you're going to plant then the next year, what you would recommend? So do you have to know like all that information before you'd make a recommendation? Like say they had, I don't know if this is even possible, but like soybeans on it one year, they harvested that, you took a sample and then they want to plant wheat on it next year. Would it, would that even be a thing? Absolutely. It is totally. That's a great question. And yeah, that's, 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 one of the things that we totally take a look at is what is that previous crop? What is going to be the crop that's going to be planted there next year? Every crop is different. Mm-hmm. So um, as you're as you're looking at what those requirements are, you're constantly thinking about what does that crop require? And then likewise, you're also thinking about what did the previous crop contribute or take out of that system? Okay, yeah. And so for example, soybeans, which you just stated, that's that's what we call a legume and mm-hmm. they're a very special plant they take atmospheric nitrogen bring it into their plant and they have this special power of um actually um putting nitrogen back in the soil it's cool. actually a really cool thing so yeah. you actually get a nitrogen credit from mm-hmm. having that that soybean or that legume crop there and so you incorporate that into your your recommendations wow cool so, so mu- complex, so much knowledge that goes into it. And, and being that you've done so many things, you, you have all this knowledge. That's why you're so great. Well, it's been, well, it's been a, it's been a fun and, a, and an exciting journey. I learned something, you know, I think in every single place that I've worked, um, it's been really fun to see how agriculture has changed over time. Mm-hmm. I think, um, in the 1990s, when we take a look back at the 1990s, mm-hmm. um, it's going to be more about than just like French rolled jeans and hair crimpers. Um, from mm-hmm. a ding- yeah, <laughs> yeah. From those were the oh. days. A lot of hot <laughs> on it. Yeah, I, I remember. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, we just think the high waisted jeans are back in style. I um, know they're coming back in. <laughs> theory. Um, but I think when we take a look at the 1990s, we're going to be able to think about. Uh, from an agriculture perspective, some pretty important technological changes that happened during that time. Um, we had precision agriculture come in and we had biotechnology. Come in. And there are things that really changed the face of agriculture dramatically. And um, I, I think about my time when I had a chance to work with Monsanto and it was really helping farmers learn a lot about biotechnology 
I was working for Monsanto when Roundup Ready Sugar Beets hit the market. And so I got to help farmers work with that system. Wow. That was one of the special things I ever got to do in my career. That was a big deal. Yeah. Because I had worked with sugar beets, crop consulting, and managing weeds. Okay. And quite frankly, growing up on a farm, mm-hmm. pulling sugar beets mm-hmm. with out that technology. Sure. And so um, it had been, that was a really neat thing. But when we think about precision agriculture and what GPS on tractors did, mm-hmm. you know, it used to be that farmers had to work from sun up to mm-hmm. sun down. You yep. have to see where you're driving. Yes. Well, the sudden the tractor can drive itself. And Game we don't changer. Have to, big time. Big time. So the definition so, of precision agriculture, Sarah, for those listening that maybe don't understand that, what would you, what, what's the definition of that? Um, precision agriculture is, is putting, putting the right thing in the right place at the right time. Okay. okay. So that might be putting the right seed at the right rate in the right place in the field at exactly the right time. It might be a fertilizer. It might be a pesticide. Um, all of those sorts of things. Okay. And we can think about precision agriculture from both an equipment standpoint as well as an agronomic input placement. So, you know, when I talk about tractors driving themselves, uh-huh. that's, that's really exciting. But one of the things that we can do with both of our sprayers and um, our planters is we've got what's called like section control. Okay. And okay. when you overlap where you've already been in the field, it will automatically shut off that part that's overlapping. Oh, that's wow, nice. that's neat. It just it, knows. It it just knows where you're at. It knows where you've been, you've made that application. So in the olden days, we didn't have that. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine as yeah. we're moving forward and this equipment is getting larger from an yep. environmental standpoint, mm-hmm. we're using less. Yep. Right. Less pesticide, less seed. It's better for the environment. It's obviously more economical for the farmers as well. Um, it's those have really those things have really helped us out. It's better um, for us farm kids too, Sarah. You talked about when you grew up and you remember hoeing beets. I remember my dad sending me out in the cornfield with a machete and saying, <laughs> "Cut down as many pigweeds as you can, and I'll give you like you know five bucks an hour, maybe." <laughs> I'm like, yeah. what kind of job is that? Like, right. man. Here's your machete, that's Jen. Hard work. That's why I say I'm a farm kid. Like, yeah. Because <laughs> I cut down weeds with a machete. I really appreciate Roundup. Uh, these days. <laughs> I do too. I do too. Uh, you know, it's so funny that you bring that up because glyphosate is, is actually one of the safest pesticides and one of the safest chemicals of any anything that's on the market today. Wow. Did you know that um, according to the LV50 um, information, you know, which is how poisonous is something? Okay. Uh, you, your caffeine is more poisonous than glyphosate. Interesting. What? Okay. Yeah, I'm not making that up. Wow. So very focused on that. That's crazy that you say that because I've been doing a lot of sports nutrition talks and all the kids are asking about caffeine. I'm like, well, when you go have like a Starbucks venti latte and then you have like an energy drink and you're stacking all these things, that's like way more than 500 milligrams of caffeine and it's not good for you. (laughs) Nothing's good in excess, right? It's a little too much, right? (laughs) A little little excessive. I mean, sometimes I get excessive with my coffee, but not very often. This is... (laughs) You know, I, water today. <laughs> I think about that in the morning when I'm like having my, you know, third cup of coffee. We all need a little caffeine. We do. It's fine. That's yeah. an interesting in fact, though. That's, <laughs> I had no idea. No, that's a good yeah. fact. I think to put it into perspective mm-hmm. for consumers to understand that technology isn't necessarily something that's scary. It's something that's actually helping the environment. I loved how you explained that. We're using less seed. We're using less chemicals. We're using technology to then improve the environment and help us to do a better job of taking care of it. So I I love that. That that makes sense to me. Um, And it's why we continue to leverage technology, I would say, wouldn't you, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, so farmers, when they are, when when farmers are, are, 
taking care of their farming operation. I don't know any farmer that is doing this job um, just for the next 10 minutes, right? right? They're trying really, really hard to pass that farming operation to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really neat because in this, in my career, I've had the opportunity to work with, you know, um, first generation farmers that are literally just getting started for the first time ever, which is something that is really special to to celebrate. But I've also worked with farms that have been, you know, um, taking care of for four or five generations. Yeah. And that is also something to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We get a long time for that to grow. But the one thing that's really unique between both of them is it doesn't really matter how far down the line they are and how long that farm's been around. They both want that farm to survive going forward. Yeah. Right. Even some of the farmers that I've had a chance to see that are going to be retiring that might not necessarily have a child that wants to come back and farm, they're still worried about making sure that that whatever they've done Mm -hmm. is going to go forward with whoever comes in and takes over that farming operation or runs that land. They want it to be left better than they got it. And so so Every farmer wants to make sure that what we're doing out there is better for the future. It almost seems like leaving a legacy. Right. Like they want to leave a legacy that's something to be proud of. And it's such big decisions that they're making Mm -hmm. that will impact, I mean, they're million dollar decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they're looking to you for advice. And I read that you even... You agronomists kind of call yourselves therapists at times because there is so much. Like that emotion. Yeah, there's a lot of emotion attached. Yeah, because they care, right? They care about it. Well, and and the decisions. Okay, so obviously there's all these decisions that a farmer has to make. You know, we've got we've got to take care of the crop. We need to produce the best crop that we possibly can. And so obviously an agronomist is really out there trying to help them, you know, make those good decisions. But the other piece of the puzzle is the economic strength of that farming operation too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. If they're not a business, they're not going to be able to take care of the environment around them. Right. I can guarantee that. And so whatever decisions we are making out there, we got to keep the guys in, in business. And mm-hmm. so I think back to some years that were economically pretty tough on the farm around here. I'm thinking like 2019 and mm-hmm. 2020. Boy, I tell you what, it was, it was commonplace to have a farmer call up and they just were talking through the decisions that they were making. Yep. And it wasn't the they just needed to bounce some things off mm-hmm. and and really think through, you know, these these big decisions. Cause right. it was some of those years it wasn't about making money. It was about making sure you weren't gonna be you were gonna lose the least amount of money. Right. So that have the sustainability to make it through that. Um which is you know, that historically, if you take a look at agriculture, mm-hmm. that is part of the story. Right. You can look back at the 1930s. You can mm-hmm. look at the 1980s. And so we go through those times. And yeah. so you, you have to figure out how to be sustainable from that time. But the tough years for farmers are tough years for you, too, because you're trying to help make these decisions. And there's no guarantee. I think that's what's so hard, yeah. too. You're, you're giving them your best advice. Nobody knows what the weather is going to be like. Right. What? Because 2019, that's when there was still crops in the ground, right? 2019 was the year that the the sugar beets did not get mm-hmm. dug. And, and has that ever home. happened before? No. As a matter of fact, I am aware of a number of farmers that uh, that is one crop that I am aware of that some farmers do not actually take crop insurance for sugar beets because you would never not get that crop harvested. Wow everything else mm-hmm. before that and so it was it was a major shock mm-hmm. it was really challenging mm-hmm. um and they had and the harvest in 2018 for the sugar beet guys was actually really tough it was muddy it was wet it was i mean i can remember going through that that fall and thinking mm-hmm. okay nobody died and i know that yeah. sounds really crazy but when you're out in the mud and you're fighting it and you're pulling stuff out and, yeah and, you know bad things can happen right and yeah when we got done with that we're like we got the crop nobody died good and then 2019 happened and oh it was that one was that one was really tough on the guys around here. yeah um but we made it mm-hmm. you know the corn prices weren't good the the commodity prices were not good either and there was a lot of other crop that was really tough to get out that year as well i don't want to make it sound like it was only the sugar right. guys that really felt that um i can remember the the soybean harvest that year 
being just absolutely nasty as well. But you make it through those things. Yep. You give the best advice that you possibly can. You let them know that you're there thinking mm-hmm. about them. And sometimes you have a guy that calls you up and he just needs to talk about a couple of things. And that's just part of it. Right. Yeah. Work through it. And it, it is nice having the history, like you were saying, of yep. this has happened before. Like in terms of there's the good years, there's the mm-hmm. bad years. And it's you just got to look flow. forward. And mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. So this is like just hearing you speak. This is no wonder you received that award. Yeah. Right. You deserved that. Where's the award? Why isn't it displayed behind you, Sarah? It it actually yes. is. Is it? it? See the piano <laughs> behind you too. Your first major there. We won't make you play a song on your piano, but we do want to see the award. Yes, we do. Okay, so are you talking about the certified crop advisor one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Two thousand. Right. Well, there must be multiple awards. I mean, if she's asking. Which she's one? award winning, like I was saying. Well. <laughs> Ooh, one, okay. that was really cool. I was really surprised to even get that's that. That's great. Oh, that's awesome. That's a big deal. So, so tell it, us, tell us about that a little bit. Like, so were you nominated by like farmers or your peers or how does one get to earn an award such as that? Okay. So the Certified Crop Advisor Program, first of all, CCA, um, what you do is you, um, you have to become certified, okay. um, a certified agronomist. And so um, if you've got a four-year or two-year degree, or even if you don't have a degree, but you get a lot of experience out in the field, you can Mm -hmm. become certified. Okay. Through enough years of experience, you have to have recommendations from farmers. You have to pass a test. You have to pass both like a North Dakota test or your state test, wherever you are, and then also the international test. Oh, Oh, my goodness. Lots of tests. Holy. And then... um, And then every two years, you have to keep up on your 40 hours of credits for continuing edu- okay. educating credits. Um, I personally have always thought that the Certified Crop Advisor Program was really important because it it does keep agronomists educated yeah. and it kind of sets a standard. Yep. Um, otherwise, quite frankly, the agronomy industry, at least in my opinion, mm-hmm. gets sort of ruled a lot by company marketing. Mm, and that's mm-hmm. the only message that farmers get a chance to hear. Yeah. Um, and I think this kind of being, brings in a, maybe a little bit more of an unbiased thing to it. So um, I, I got certified back in 2005. Okay. So I've been a um, certified agronomist for that entire time. Um, and then, yeah, I I got, I served on our, our CCA board here in North Dakota. Um, and I was kind of getting done with that. And somebody Somebody nominated me, which I was really surprised about that. I, I still don't know who nominated me and then voted on by my my peers, the other certified crop advisors. And so, yeah, that was that was really cool. That is cool. I love it. And like you talked about um, it being important to stay on top of like the evidence based practice and being like unbiased. I think that's a good thing. I th- we have that as dietitians as well. We have to get continuing education because as you've been speaking about things change like and the research changes and there's different things coming out all the time but who do farmers go to when they want an unbiased right. recommendation that would be somebody like you right Sarah yeah well and you know so I, I take it upon like I think it's my responsibility as an agronomist to make sure that I know what pests are coming in mm-hmm. you know I remember a time in North Dakota agriculture where soybean aphids was not a part of anything we ever worried about. That was a pest that actually moved into North Dakota. Okay. Really? I remember soybean production. Um, so for anybody who listens to this, that's an agronomist, they're going to laugh and be like, wow, she's really old. She's been around forever. She remembers soybean production without soybean aphids. Um, <laughs> but yes, there was life um, in, with soybeans in North Dakota before soybean aphids. And so, um, and so I remember that. Now we're dealing with some new weeds coming in, like water hemp and palmer amaranth. You have to watch those things. They come yeah. in and think about how to how to how to deal with that. New new issues come up. Um different new crops come in and we start dealing yeah. with new crops all the time. Okay. Um and which is exciting and fun. You know, corn wasn't nearly as big of a deal in North Dakota at the very beginning of my career as it is now. Yeah. And uh, I can remember when I was working for Monsanto, especially up in the northern parts of North Dakota, I had the chance to help some new new growers learn how to raise corn for the first time ever. That was super fun. It was great, you know? That's cool. Um, but you have to learn how to right. do that and make sure you're providing good information. 
So yeah. I think that education component is just really important. And I think integrity in our recommendations is really important. Um, but I see that actually very similar to dietitians and, yeah. and doctors and mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. So that's so cool. Staying ahead of it. I feel like it's yeah. time for questions. We've oh, learned a okay. lot. Ready for host halftime? I think so. I feel oh, like Sarah's gonna have some good questions for us. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. And uh, should we show her what our award looks yes, like? Yes, I should. Because I think we were just talking about <laughs> corn. Um, so Here's this our is award. our trophy. Hey, this is what the trophy looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So That's Heather, awesome. it's golden. Heather has her name on it, like usual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at trivia. <laughs> But you know, I'll try my best. This for might you, be your day, Jen. This might be your day. I just won't give Heather her marker, and then she can't win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. So okay. we're ready. Okay. So question number one: um, How many egg commodities, like agriculture commodities, does North Dakota produce that we are actually number one in production? Okay. It's I a think lot. I have a pretty good guess. It's a lot. Okay. I'm going to say, what'd you say? I have 13. I have 46. Eight. Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right. Okay. So I'm closest. Jen got that (laughs) point. (laughs) So so it's dried edible bean. Okay. So if anybody likes chili with beans, that's that. Pinto beans, which is a kind of that. Canola, black seed, honey. Yes, we are number one in honey production. Yes. Cool. Um, Dry edible peas. Dura wheat and spring wheat, which so if you like your oh. pasta, yeah, there you go. go. Yeah, okay, good to know. Eat your carbs, like I've been telling That's my athletes right. this week. All of those That's, folks that yep. are listening, eat your carbs. And if you need more, uh, <laughs> more um, carbs, North Dakota is number five in potatoes. That uh, too. I have a farmer's daughter, so I always gotta, you know, great, go great sports there. foods, great sports foods. You're from Hoople, right, Sarah? Yes, but I am. We are, oh. yep. We're going to Tater Town Days. Yeah. It's like on my calendar. Yep. That's it's on our excited. list. Yes. <laughs> Who travels with Jen and Heather. <laughs> That's super fun. I could still sew a burlap sack, a hundred pound burlap sack by hand if I needed to. Ooh. If I could find a sewing needle. That's a good so, talent yeah. to have in your back That's pocket. That's kind of cool. You never know. You never know. No, um, totally not useful anymore because we have these <laughs> off sewing machines. But yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, question number two. Um, how many dollars does North Dakota agriculture contribute to the North Dakota economy? Each year? Um, yeah. Okay. Mm. I think it's every year. <laughs> well, we have the... Same, but Ooh, I have you? billion. Oh, I have thirty million. Okay, it is thirty point eight billion. Oh! With- <laughs> I was way off. I like that we both had thirty. Well, I did say that on one of our promos, and so that's why I know it. I'm admitting it. Oh. Now I feel like I cheated, or it's just past that's knowledge past from knowledge. Common Ground. I mean, if you listen to Common right. Ground, you would wasn't know. in my scripting. I guess <laughs> it's okay, Sarah. It's okay. <laughs> but, okay, that's isn't that insane? Can we talk that's about that? Thirty billion dollars. <laughs> it's a really big deal. Yes, it's I don't even real, know what that looks like. Uh, I know it's North Dakota agriculture. I mean, we the oil industry, the energy industry in North Dakota, especially out west, is is a very big deal as well. I don't want to overshadow that, but the agriculture in in North Dakota touches every single town, every mm-hmm. single town, all across North Dakota. It's jobs, it, um, it's, it's the farmers, it's going to town to, to purchase things at the local store, mm-hmm. it's the tractor dealership, it, it just, it hits every single aspect. Absolutely. You're right, it's a far reach. It, it touches everything. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Fun so fact. You do not have to be a farmer to, um, to be involved in agriculture and have a great career in agriculture. Absolutely. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So obviously, soils is my favorite part um, of agronomy. So we can't add, we can't go through this trivia thing without asking okay. soils question. Okay. Right. So North Dakota is really known for its prairie soils, right? Those yep. grass, prairie soils, very fertile. 
but in the Red River Valley, we actually have a very unique um, soil type that is in the Red River Valley. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it is or what characterizes that soil? And this is very obviously a very open, broad-ended okay. question. But so the name of the soil or why it's that way, Sarah? Let's, I'll give you, I'll, 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 I think why, I know what why, it is. I feel like, I think I know. Okay. Okay. Why is it that way? We'll do it that way. Rather than the name, that'll probably be. Um, it's, yeah. uh, hold on. I have a long answer. Okay. That's, I think that's fair. I, I don't mean to make a, like, talk for a long time about soil, but hey, sorry. You guys asked But it is podcast. why we're so excellent at agriculture. I mean, if not for this soil, then our crops wouldn't well, be as good as they are. Okay. Yep. I said glacier. I said Lake Agassiz River Basin. Oh, great. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it, but here's the thing. We've got, oh, boy. <laughs> as we go from what in North Dakota <laughs> and just off the Red River Valley, we get to those prairie soils, okay? And they don't have as much clay content as the Red River Valley. When you're in the Red River Valley, mm, clay. heard of people talk about that Fargo clay. Yeah. It's very thick very um very dense very sticky soil when it's muddy okay. when it dries out those the clumps get to be like hard lumps sure. right yeah yeah like getting stuck together yep. yeah that clay content of a fargo clay is very unique hmm. and actually is not even considered to be a prairie grass soil hmm. uh, when we classify out different kinds of of soils under their soil orders um, it's actually in a completely different soil order than what the, the, the prairie soils would be. Um, and it's known for its high clay content, okay. its water holding capacity, uh. and its ability to um, to crack. Like if you see those big, huge yep. cracks on yeah. the field, um, that's the type of clay that we've got. It would huh. be terrible to make pottery out of. Right. You, as if you put it into a kiln, it would break apart. And anyway... So it's a very unique, very thick, very uh, black, high organic matter soil. And it's very, uh, we're one of the places that has that. It's in, it's in a soil order called Vertisols, which is... I was going to say that. That was going to be my answer, actually. Vertisols. Okay. No. I... <laughs> no. No. Oh, okay. You're so cool. <laughs> Vertisols. Okay. And so that has to do with the clay content. Which is a good yep. thing because it retains moisture. Yeah, but oh. it can also be very challenging. And the farmers that I've seen that um, that farm on that type of soil, it you have to really plant it when it's ready to go. And if you don't, um, it kind of dries out really, oh. really fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it can be very, I, it's my very favorite soil anywhere. Okay. Um, like probably because it's in my backyard. But it's just something that's very unique to North Dakota. The oh. Fargo clay or rye clay, it's a versatile type soil. Versatile type soil. You know, soil. would have never guessed it. had no idea, and that is so interesting. It genuinely Yeah, is. for sure. Okay. And that we're unique here. Right. In the Red River Valley. Mm -hmm. So we tied. Yeah. Yep. One to one. That's good. That's, that's okay good for us. H and J. <laughs> yes. You know, hey, I didn't lose this time. That's <laughs> like winning today, Sarah. So I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I feel like we need to have you back and just talk about soil. There's so much yeah. to learn. Oh, soil is obviously, I mean, that's why I got my master's degree in that. It just, it's a very fascinating thing. I think when people are, um, are, are walking across, um, their garden or, 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 you know, the ground, you just take for granted mm -hmm. what's, what's happening under there, but you don't necessarily always think about it's a very dynamic, you've got inorganic chemistry happening, mm -hmm. you've got microbiology going on. Yeah. Uh, there's just, there's so much happening, different soil textures, different, it's it's a very, yeah, I get to be kind of a geek about that stuff. That's but it, so cool. It is cool. <laughs> you have so much knowledge and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. Yeah. We just have one final question for you, Sarah. Um, what's your favorite part of being involved in North Dakota agriculture? Okay, so um, I knew you guys were going to ask me that, and there's actually two parts to okay. that answer. So, um, 
So I can remember being out scouting, doing my first scouting internship, which was out of the Reynolds, North Dakota area. And I can remember being out there and really getting a chance to look at the crop and think about things and thinking to myself, man, if I can just do this for the rest of my life, this is going to be amazing. So, um, but there's really two drivers behind it. Um, one, when you get to be an agronomist, you really get to help produce the safest, most abundant, most affordable food for everyone to eat. And that to me is really important because I think everybody should have mm-hmm. access to safe, nutritious, and affordable food. Yep. And that is what I think, you know, agronomists do. But second of all, helping farmers. I I absolutely love that when you have that working relationship with with the farmers and you know that you're really helping them make mm-hmm. good decisions for their farming operation, the success and the future of their farming operation. It's a pretty exciting thing to be involved in. Um, and that's something, that relationship is never something to be taken for granted. So it's it's a pretty neat, it's pretty neat to be involved with it. That's awesome. I love it. And it all comes down to the people, it seems yes. like, Heather. Yes. Well, we're lucky to have you in North Dakota, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending the morning with us, chatting about your work and all things agriculture. We appreciate Super. your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. It was great to chat with all of you. So. Yes. Hopefully we'll see you at Tater Town Days. Yes. (laughs) He knows for everyone. Yes. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Bye. My goodness. You weren't going to save yourself. No, I wasn't. But (laughs) (laughs) But now we know like a fun word. We know a good word. And then these are the things when they ask questions like that, I realize how little I know. Yes. There's just so much I don't know. I know exactly all the fun words and like even just knowing like the type of soil now that we walk right. on every day here. Right. I'm on I'm gonna look a little closer now. I know. Same at the soil. You know what really drives my husband nuts? Mm. Like it, when I call soil dirt, he's like, It's not dirt, it's soil. Oh, that's like, a so no-no. don't call it dirt. Always say call it soil. soil. Mm-hmm. It does yep. sound better. I know. I you think so. Right. Sorry, Jen. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. I've learned. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> so, till next time. Till next time. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Common Ground North Dakota podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Common Ground North Dakota podcast. Make sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Most importantly, send us your questions about North Dakota agriculture by visiting our website. You might win a prize. We'll see you in the next episode of the Common Ground North Dakota podcast.